About 18 months ago, something that I had spent more or less my whole adult life dreading happened to me. Um, I became a father. My wife, Genia, and I had a son named George. Um, there was nothing noble about my dreading fatherhood. It wasn't that I thought it would be spiritually overwhelming or that I felt unprepared for the duties, though I felt unprepared for the duties, and was in fact unprepared for the duties. That wasn't really what bothered me or what I worried about. What I dreaded about fatherhood is that I thought it would suck. <laughs> that children, in fact, aren't worth the effort. Um, I'd like to say that I'm a former child hater now that I'm a parent, but there's really nothing particularly former about it. They're boring. They don't know anything. <laughs> nothing to say. <clears throat> they spend most of their time doing boring things, like preschool. <laughs> it's really hard for me to see how you could feel anything other than resentment toward a creature that demands so much, <laughs> diaper changes, and cannot offer even a good conversation in return. <laughs> Plus, it seems to me that children provide or produce very deeply noxious effects in the world at large. Um, Jeannie and I spent the first four or five years of our marriage, in fact, all of our marriage, prior to George's birth, watching our friends one by one succumb to the tedium of parenthood. Children seem come, to come equipped with a remarkable ability to make their parents lose all perspective in life, to lose perspective in particular um, on the fact that their children are not the most interesting things in the world. <laughs> you are, in fact, right this minute, witnessing an instance of this problem, as I stand in front of you and tell a story about my fucking kid, as if you care. <laughs> it was precisely to avoid ever being in this situation that I spent the first five years of my marriage fighting the possibility of pregnancy. Unfortunately, my marriage being what it is, my wife's vision of our having a child ultimately prevailed over my vision of our avoiding children altogether. Um, and so we set about the task of producing children. <laughs> Many couples start this before five years is the cycle, but that was the way it worked for us. Um, it turns out that if you start trying to have a child when you're in your early 40s, you find that the process is quite hard. Given, generally speaking, it seems as though the process is more attractive than the result. This is why there's a problem of unwanted pregnancies in the world. But when you, in fact, want one, it turns out to be more difficult than you might expect. In our early 40s, at least, it was more difficult than we expected. We spent about a year trying somehow to magically time the intimate rhythms of our life with some complicated calendrical system so that all bodily fluids would be exactly the right temperature. <laughs> this did not result in conception. It instead resulted in the radical evacuation of intimacy from the intimate rhythms of our lives. The evacuation was so radical that we decided to do it all together to evacuate it completely and go through the process of in vitro fertilization, where intimacy is absolutely irrelevant. In fact, my contribution to my son's conception is easily the least erotic moment that I have experienced in my life. It took place in a fertility clinic in Manhattan on a Saturday morning at 7 a.m. fertility clinic was closed on Saturdays. So after I arrived, I had to wait for a young nurse in her early 30s to arrive at the clinic and open it for me so that I could, as the clinic euphemistically put it, produce. <laughs> the nurse showed up with her boyfriend. And the three of us happily marched into the clinic. She gave me a small bottle and pointed my way into a little cubicle which had no windows, but did have several glossy magazines. The magazines, I suspect, were there to stimulate me um, in the effort to produce. But instead, all they did was stimulate my imagination 
to notice that many people have produced there before. <laughs> so whatever erotic appeal the various images might have had was more than counterbalanced by my coupling them with images of older, balding people like myself responding to the images. <laughs> It is amazing to me that I was able to leave that room ever with a less than empty bottle. And amazing to me still that I managed somehow not to faint in embarrassment when I walked out and presented it to the nurse with her boyfriend there looking at me. I think in my memory he winks, but I doubt he did that in fact when it happened. From such inauspicious origins came my son nine months later, at five in the morning. Inconsiderate time, I think, to be born. <laughs> robbing both his mother and me of a full night of sleep. Okay. It's unseemly to do what I'm about to do. It's unseemly for a man to complain in any way about the process of labor. Deeply unseemly. It's, 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 it's unthinkable. We don't go through pregnancy. We don't go through labor. We just sort of stand on the side and offer support. And since the process of delivering a child happens before the process of labor ends, for our doing nothing, we are rewarded with the sort of first hold, first hug of the child, as the afterbirth placenta part of pregnancy is unfolding over in the corner of the room. We get to bounce with the little new nipper and talk to him. For many people, I think this is a joyous moment. But for me, it was a deeply traumatic moment. <laughs> what do you say to someone who has just gone through labor? What do you say to that person? This is probably the only time a child would ever have an interesting experience, yet he can't possibly say anything to you about it. <laughs> I, stam I sat and stammered for a couple minutes. And then I do what I think many people do in this circumstance, which is I resorted to pure cliche. <clears throat> I used the world's most hackneyed phrases, and I gave the baby what amounted more or less to a pep talk. <laughs> I said something like, George, your birth is a dream come true for your mother and me. George, we will do everything in our power to show you the pleasures of life. And we will do everything in our power to teach you how to enjoy them. The world is not filled simply with pleasures, though. And we will do everything in our power to shield you from its sorrows. And because we cannot shield you from all of its sorrows, we will do everything in our power to teach you how to manage and handle those sorrows that you will experience in this We, George, hope to be as much of a blessing to your life as you are to ours. So forth and so forth. <laughs> the words sound cliché now. They sounded cliché to me as I said them. In fact, one of my first thoughts is that my son's first response to me is to think that I'm a cheese law. That he is thinking, in fact, Dad, can't you come up with something better than this? Do you have to give me such boring crap? But it was all I could think to say. Because I did not in any way understand George, this little thing, to be any other, anything other than just a baby. It was impossible for me to imagine what it would be like to have a personal relationship to him. He was, in fact, nothing but a bundle of needs, as I understood it. <laughs> and in fact, he remained a bundle of needs the whole day, so far as I was concerned. He needed to be photographed. He needed to be discussed to relatives. He needed to be bounced on the knee, so forth and so on. So that at the end of the day, when a nurse came and suggested to Genia and I that Genia needed to Genia and me, I should say, I'm an English professor. Genia and me <laughs> that Genia should spend the night by herself because we were tired, and that George should spend the night in the nursery in the hospital, and that I should go home. That seemed like a great idea, and it seemed like an even greater idea when she wheeled George out of our room in, a, in, a, in his little roller crib down to the hospital nursery. Awesome. I am finally free of parenthood, at least for the remainder of the night. And I quite happily kissed Genia on the cheek and said, boy, isn't it weird that we're parents? Ha ha ha, finger crossed behind my back, and headed out, thinking about whether I had a full 12 pack or just eight or nine beers at home. <laughs> This 
looked like a bachelor night. But as I walked down the hallway to the hotel, I mean, to the hospital elevator, I stopped briefly. This is where things stop being in any way funny and just become deeply cheesy for the rest of my talk. Um, I stopped and looked through the window into the nursery. The nursery in this, in this particular hospital was huge. It had maybe 30 little baby cribs. And you know, babies start off looking very much like babies. These babies were all wearing exactly the same hospital baby issued clothing. <laughs> As it turns out, you don't tend to remember to bring your you know, snazzy little cashmere jumper that your grandmother gives when you race off on your, when your wife's water is breaking. So everybody's wearing the same clothes. And since it's, uh, there's a danger that babies will get jaundice early in life if they're not um, around ultraviolet light, Many of them are under um, ultraviolet lamps, so they are all wearing these very complicated <laughs> baby goggles. <laughs> they all look as though they've gone incognito. <laughs> and the previous day, I could not have distinguished one of them from another. As I walked past this window thinking about the Knicks game I was about to watch and the beer I was about to have, I briefly looked through the window and my eyes were just riveted, immediately stuck on one of these children, which I knew beyond, the, as deeply as I've never known anything, I knew as deeply as I could ever know anything, that this was George. It was really deeply disturbing. It was something like having a heart, which was a new experience to me. <laughs> um, and unfortunately for me, this, when I saw George at this moment, George was crying. Or he wasn't, I mean, he couldn't see tears coming down, but he was like, making gesticulations of misery. <laughs> and rather than thinking, serves you right for keeping me up last night, my heart instead melted. And I wanted more than anything I could imagine somehow to prevent him from suffering this misery, or somehow to teach him how to manage living through this misery, or somehow to introduce him to whatever pleasures he had managed to discover in his tiny little 24 hours of life. I went home that night eager to drink and watch the Knicks and then go to sleep, and instead I just basically sat up all night worrying, worrying that somehow I had not done enough to comfort George, so forth and so on. Um, prior to this night, I thought I had a really good idea of what a cliche was. Um, I, I wasn't certain that I always avoided a cliche, being a cliche, but I was pretty sure what they were. I thought there were moments where our language failed our imagination. There were moments where, in the face of the complexity and richness of life, we could only offer shop-worn, hackneyed phrases. But since I decided that I had that almost exactly backward, the cliches don't happen when words fail imagination, but rather when imagination fails words. The little cheesy things I said to George upon his birth were absolutely cheesy. They were exactly the kind of shit you might read on a Hallmark card. But it turns out that they were also absolutely true and, at least from my perspective, absolutely meaningful. I began that little speech after I stammered for a while by saying to George, you, George, this is probably the first time I even called him by his name, George, you probably won't be able to understand this until you get older. But I didn't realize at the time I said that is that would be as true for me as it would be for him. And that I would only be able to learn this despite my sense that babies have nothing to offer, nothing to teach us, by way of his example. Thanks. <laughs>